If you've ever used the rail network in London, you may have noticed something curious. Most lines in the city are electrified these days, but some trains pick their power up from an overhead wire, and some pick it up from a third rail. Some trains, like on the Thameslink, even have to swap over partway through their journeys. So obvious question, why? Well, it all comes down to history, and you can actually blame the underground. In 1883, Magnus Volk opened Britain's first permanent electric railway along the seafront at Brighton. In many ways, it was a novelty. But Volk was very serious about electricity. And what his railway demonstrated was that this new form of propulsion had potential. But for that potential to be realised, it would need to be trialled on a larger scale. Enter the City and South London Railway. The City and South London was the first deep-level underground line in London, running from Stockwell in South London to King William Street in the city. Being far underground, the smoke and steam of conventional locomotives was a no-no, so initially it was going to be powered by cable haulage, similar to the San Francisco streetcars. But the chairman, Charles Gray Mott, realised that this was a highly flawed system. It lacked flexibility. Trains couldn't swap tracks, they couldn't reverse individually, and one engine breakdown or snapped cable would immobilise the entire line. So the company looked instead at electricity. When the line opened in 1890, it used electric locomotives and proved on the whole to be a massive technological success. The engines were relatively crude by modern standards and the power supply was barely sufficient. But it proved a point. Electricity had many advantages over steam power. It was quiet. Electric trains could accelerate faster. They didn't produce smoke and soot. They were more efficient. A steam locomotive uses only 8% of the energy in the coal it burns, compared to 40% in a power station. And from a PR point of view, they were futuristic. Electric trains were a selling point in themselves. They could boost passenger numbers. This was nicknamed the Sparks Effect. As so often happens during the early days of a technology, there was a degree of trial and error as different modes of power transmission were tried. Two types emerged as favourites, each with advantages and disadvantages. There were overhead wires and there was third rail pickup. The biggest advantage of overhead wires was that they could carry a higher voltage, so they needed fewer electrical substations. The big disadvantage is that you need to install a lot of infrastructure which can be quite unsightly and expensive, as well as requiring enough headroom in tunnels and under bridges. If you have long distances to cover, though, this is your man. Third rail is simpler to install and cheaper. It's a good choice for short distances, things like suburban commuter railways where you have frequent stations. It's less vulnerable to severe weather conditions like high winds and heavy snow. However, it's also less safe due to the rails being on the ground where they can be stepped on. Following the success of the city in South London, other rail service providers, which is a term I don't think anyone would have used back then, got on the electricity bandwagon. Tram companies and underground railways were enthusiastic adopters. Mainline railways were a little slower, due partly to the cost and due partly to the lack of competition although some of the wealthier companies were very interested. In London, there was competition. Both the underground and the trams poached passengers from the railways. It was clear that the railways couldn't beat them, although the Great Eastern Railway attempted to cheat by building an enormous and impractically heavy tank engine known as the Decapod, which could accelerate as fast as an electric train, but do basically nothing else. For everyone else, they'd have to adopt the new technology or take a hit. The London, Brighton and South Coast Railway were the first to go for it, with what they called the Elevated Electric Railway in South London. This used overhead power and ran along what's now part of the overground. The second company to go for it in a big way was the London and South Western Railway. In the early 20th century, the underground was firmly encroaching on their turf. The District Railway ran trains to Richmond, Wimbledon and Hounslow, all destinations on the LSWR. The Central London Railway, which ran to Shepherd's Bush, was also looking to extend out into the suburbs. By 1912, passenger numbers were in serious decline, so the company felt that they had to act fast. Fortunately, they had an ace up their sleeve. 
The first electric tube railway was the city in South London, as I said. This used third rail pickup. An engineer involved in the construction of the line and its equipment was one Herbert Jones. The second electric tube railway was the Waterloo and City Railway, which opened in 1898 and also employed Jones. Now, the thing about the Waterloo and City was that it was not entirely independent. It was heavily backed by the LSWR because they wanted a route into the City of London. Their terminus at Waterloo was south of the Thames, some distance from where commuters might actually want to get to. In fact, in 1906, the LSWR bought the Waterloo and City out. What all this meant was that the LSWR had a working association with Jones, who they brought on as a consultant for their electrification programme. Third Rail was what he knew, so Third Rail was what they went with. It made sense. While they had longer distance routes to places like Portsmouth and Southampton, they only intended to electrify the shorter distance suburban routes. They decided initially to cover the loop lines to Hounslow and Kingston, the branch lines to Hampton Court and Shepperton, the line out to Effingham Junction, and the line from Wandsworth Town to Wimbledon that's now mostly part of the underground. In the longer term, they planned to extend to Guildford. Electrification was a slow process, made slower by the outbreak of the First World War. In fact, the first electric trains began running in 1915. In 1923, the railways of Britain were, with a few exceptions, grouped together into four major companies. This was done for financial reasons. Some railways were wealthier than others, and this meant that the rich lines could pay for the poor lines. There were four companies. The London and North Eastern Railway, the London Midland and Scottish Railway, the Great Western Railway, and the Southern Railway. The Southern consisted of the LSWR, the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway, and the South Eastern and Chatham Railway. The majority of its income came from passenger trains, so electrification of the entire network, particularly the commuter lines into London, was a priority. The LSWR system had proved reliable and was the most widespread, so that was adopted as the standard. Electrification from now on would be done with the third rail, with the old South London line being brought in line with the rest of the system. As for other electric lines in Britain, they were powered according to their circumstances. Some used a third rail, some used overhead lines. The Underground had adopted a four rail system, pioneered in America, and ironically, the city in South London now used that. The line from Euston to Watford had to share with the Underground's Bakerloo line, so the electrification between those two had to be compatible. But most of the railways in London weren't electrified. The companies that owned them either didn't want it or couldn't afford it. But electric rail technology improved, and by the 1930s it was clear that electricity was the future, not just for commuter rail, but for railways in general. Overhead wires were to be the new standard everywhere except on the Southern since they were best suited to a long-distance network. Electrification of the lines out of London was gradual. In fact, the line out of Marylebone is still diesel-powered. But by the time the wires were going up on Britain's main lines, the south of the country already had miles upon miles of third rail track. Too much to convert, or at least to convert cheaply. And it tended on the whole to work pretty well, so they just kept it. This has had its issues. For instance, the Eurostar trains that had to use the old southern tracks in England had to be able to pick up from both the third rail and overhead wires. Ditto the North London Lines trains, which went from the former Southern Railways tracks to the former London Midland and Scottish Railways. Ditto the Thameslink and Overground trains, which face the same problem. These days, for a new above-ground heavy rail line to be electrified using third rail pickup is very rare. There has been talk of converting the third rail to overhead electrification, but I don't think it's happening any time soon. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, please do leave a like and consider subscribing for more. I would like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your support. You are the substation to my third rail. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio.